Hi guys, I'm absolutely delighted to be here at the Ultra Wellness Center in Lenox, Massachusetts with Dr. Mark Hyman, um, who has just um, taken a break from seeing his patients today. He is a functional medicine doctor. He's um, 11 times best New York Times best-selling author and um, someone who has inspired me very, very much over the past few years. So I'm really honored to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. So um, tell us a little bit about what is different about the medicine that takes place in this center. Well, this is a functional medicine practice. We have uh, three doctors, two physicians assistants. We have five nutritionists and a bunch of nurses. And essentially we do um, functional medicine Okay. in a pretty advanced way here because we've been all doing this for over 20 years right and uh, we see people from all over the world who come in with complex problems that mm -hmm. often no one else can treat or fix yes. uh, everything from cardiometabolic disease to autoimmune diseases to neurologic problems to behavioral emotional issues um, skin disorders hormonal disorders digestive disorders pretty much everything that um, we don't deal well with with conventional treatment. We do a great job here. Okay, so give us an idea of what that might look like. You know, a, a, an idea of a patient you've seen maybe over the past month who came in with a very complex. Okay, well, there was this young girl who um, had severe autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. She had something called mixed connective tissue disorder. Um, she was uh, treated with uh, many medications. Uh, which included steroids, uh, chemotherapy drugs. She was getting intravenous solumedrol, which is a very powerful um, intravenous steroid mm -hmm. every three weeks just to function. She had arthritis, she had muscle damage, she had uh, skin rashes, she had liver inflammation, her blood was affected. She uh, really was quite sick. Um, and uh, she came in and basically rather than saying what immunosuppressive drug could we give her, how do we shut off her inflammation, how do we shut off her inflammation, we asked a different set of questions, which is why? Why is she inflamed? What's the root cause? And uh, traditional medicine is not great at navigating to the root causes. We're good at sort of putting out um, fires, but it's like a whack-a-mole, you know, and, and often the symptoms uh, may be mitigated or improved, but it's not cured. Yes. And, uh, you know, typically doctors believe that certain diseases can't be cured, like diabetes or autoimmune diseases or dementia. But the truth is many of them can. And in this young girl, we found she had a terrible history of antibiotics. Her gut was kind of a mess. And a lot of the immune system is in the gut. Uh, mm -hmm. She was eating a terrible diet. She loves sushi, although that was one redeeming feature. She ate fish, but it was tuna fish, which caused mercury excess in her body, which can cause autoimmune disease. And so we eliminated uh, foods that were inflammatory. We mm -hmm. gave her an anti-inflammatory diet. We uh, treated her gut because she had a lot of inflammation in her gut that we measured. We looked at her heavy metal levels. She had high mercury, so we treated that. And we optimized her nutrition, which was not great, and nutritional support like vitamin D and fish oil. And within two months, uh, her symptoms were gone uh, within a year uh, she was off all her medication and her numbers all normalized so when you go see a rheumatologist for example they'll check your ANA or rheumatoid mm -hmm. factor um, and if it's elevated they never check it again because it's it doesn't change but all of her antibody levels went back to normal except for one which stayed a little bit elevated but I mean it was just remarkable to see and uh, again, this is something we just don't see. Um, yeah. So that sounds like a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's just yeah. science. <laughs> yes, it's just science. It's just but, science. Um, it's, it's applying. The problem is when we have this, this current paradigm that we've all learned, which is disease-based. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's based on a reaction to symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, and we never learn how to think about the body from the point of view of how is it really organized? What are the laws of biology? What is... The, the science of health and how do you create a healthy person how do you fix the things that are causing people to be out of balance and how yes. do you put in the things that help people get into balance yeah. and when you do that people get better and it's it's just remarkable it's not it's not that hard yeah so it seems like a miracle but it's just not 
So how much of a factor is lifestyle change in, in what you do? So some things are all lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Some things are more complicated, right? Yes. So if someone has Lyme disease or mold exposure or heavy metals or intestinal infection, there may be more advanced things. But if you start with the foundation, it's really remarkable. Yeah. I mean, we had a patient recently who she was a type two diabetic on yes. insulin for 10 years. She had heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, her ejection fraction was 35%, which is means your heart's not pumping very well. She had kidney failure, not on dialysis, but getting there. Liver problems, fatty liver and high liver function tests. She mm -hmm. was hypertensive. She Her BMI, her body mass index was 43, which is, you know, normal is 25 or less. And over yeah. 30 is obese. And she was severely obese. Um, she was on so many medications. She was 65 and you know, maybe had a year or two left. <clears throat> I mean, the mortality on heart failure is two years. Like, worse than cancer, a lot of cancers. So she came in. We did just super simple like just changed her diet got her on a few basic supplements just like a multi fish oil vitamin nothing super fancy um we used a very strategic diet which was anti-inflammatory it's low glycemic it's helps heal the gut and it's very detoxifying mm -hmm. and it, essentially it's, it's what i've created called the 10-day detox diet but it really is just a derivative of the diets we use in functional medicine that is, is helpful for fixing the gut and the immune system and blood sugar. Three days she was off her insulin. After 10 years she's on insulin shots. Three months, um, she lost 43 pounds. Her um, blood sugar was normal. Her heart failure reversed completely. Her kidney failure reversed completely. Her liver functions normalized. Her blood pressure was normal. And she was off all her medications. And after a year she lost 116 pounds and has got her life back. Uh, and, you know, when you, when, and by the way, she saved herself on her medication copay. So in America, we have copays, which means you have to pay a certain amount, like 20% or 10% of your cost. Her copay was, was $20,000. And she saved all that money just wow. by, and what I, what the insurance company was paying, who knows, was $100,000 or more. Plus, you know, her use of medical services and hospitalizations. And yes. So, you know, she saved probably hundreds of thousands of dollars for the healthcare system every year. But, you know, it's, it, you know, and if, and we implemented it with her support of a coach, and which is really important for helping people create this distinct behavior change. We had her in a group setting. And, yeah. you know, when you see this kind of stuff, you go, you know, I'm, I'll share a picture. Maybe you can share with your video, but yeah, uh, it's just like, and then you hear doctors saying, well, you can't reverse diabetes. You know, it's just, you, if you don't know what to do, you can't like, if you, you know, if you don't know how to do something, of course you can't do it. And yes. that's what we see in medicine. We're not trained yes. to do this. So we assume it can't be done where in fact we easily can do it. Yeah. And I love the fact that you put her in a group scenario, so she had that sort of support and and, and you didn't feel alone because that, that um, from where I'm coming from as a functional medicine health coach, um, I know how crucial that support is. And I think sometimes people can underestimate how complicated it can be for people and how messy yeah. to change their lifestyle when they've got so mired right. in habits and maybe all their peers eat and drink and live a certain way. Yeah. It, it can be a really massive challenge. I remember chatting to someone recently who's a chef and he really works out, so he's very fit. And he said to me, Susie, I don't understand why anyone would be obese. Like all they need to do is, everyone's got access to the internet, all they need to do is Google how to eat Dr. healthily. <laughs> no, 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 he didn't, he didn't know about you. He said, Google how to eat healthily and what's the problem? many problems with that. I mean, you know, oh, if it were only that simple, but of course it's not. It's no. far more complex. I mean, you shared that. a story of a guy who wanted to lose weight, was very obese. Yeah. Uh, and he tried for a little bit uh, and, he and gave said up. he gave up because yeah. he said he had no willpower. Yes. Now, willpower is really a fiction yeah. because when you eat certain foods, 
it hijacks your brain chemistry and your hormones in such a way that willpower is meaningless, yes. right? If I, if I said, you know, I'm going to pay you a million dollars, but I want you to hold your breath underwater for 10 minutes and you had the willpower to do it. There's yeah. no way you could do it because yes. the biology takes over yeah. and you, you have to breathe. <laughs> yes. And, and the same way the foods we're eating are highly addictive. I, I don't yeah. know if you heard, saw this study came out, I think last week, uh, where they, it was a metabolic ward study where they took, um, two groups of people. So they gave, or I think they actually, um, no, they did the same. I think they did the same people. Um, I can't remember. Well, the point is they took basically 10 people and they fed them processed food. Yeah. Uh, starch. I mean, it was, it was, and they gave them, said, we eat whatever you want. Here's the food. And then they gave people real food, mm -hmm. whole food. Eat whatever you want. And they put them in a metabolic ward. So they were admitted to the hospital for a month. So they tracked everything. And they found that the group that ate the processed food ate 500 calories more a day wow. because they couldn't control their hunger because they were yes. eating foods that were driving the hunger. Yeah. And then they, they lost, they gained two pounds. Mm -hmm. The group that had whole food didn't gain two pounds. They actually lost two pounds. Yeah. So it was a four pound difference. If you calculate what that would be over a year, if you ate processed food, you would gain 52 pounds. So simply cutting out anything that is in a package, unless it's a real yeah. food, then uh, you could easily solve the entire obesity epidemic and save could. literally trillions of dollars. Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah. know what the numbers are in the UK, but in the US, it's, I think, $3.6 trillion in healthcare costs just from diabetes and obesity. Yeah, yeah. So we're well on the way. We're like trotting behind you. And unfortunately, you know, we're fat man of Europe and it's, it's Maybe not a galloping. Rosy, You're getting catching Yeah, up. it's not a rosy picture. Um, but I do a lot of group coaching. And what I hear again and again is like, well, Susie, it's so convenient. And I think we really have um, just been sold this myth of convenience. You know, we're too busy to, to cook. You know, it's yeah. just eat out of a box. You're too busy to make your breakfast. Here's a meal replacement bar. Mm. Um, and the food industry has been very clever in just jumping on our, our time poor, busy, busy lifestyle. So it's difficult for people, especially if you haven't grown up in a family who cooks. It's to, a skill like anything. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But I think it's that support so that people can see that it is accessible yeah. to them. I mean, I had a story to tell you. It was interesting. You know? so, so the, the food industry convened. Uh, in the I think late 50s, early 60s, to try to to fight this trend that was happening at the time for people to eat real food. Yeah. And I don't know if you ever heard of Betty Crocker, but you know, let me tell you, Mark. Can I tell you? I opened up my cupboard uh -huh. recently. It was maybe uh -huh. 18 months ago, and there were five packets of Betty Crocker red velvet cake mix because it had yeah. been on offer and my husband had been out with the kids so I went mental as you can imagine and to, I, they're going out for house I kept one of them as a show and tell yeah. and I do a talk but my what? kids really believe there is a Betty Crocker right so Betty Crocker yeah. was was an invention of, of the food industry yeah to, in, to sort of combat the advocacy of another woman named Betty who was a home ec teacher who wanted people to cook and eat real food and hey. yeah, and so they they then they created the Betty Crocker cookbook, which my mother had, which basically put uh, processed food into f real food recipes to kind of subvert the American kitchen. They, so they put in like one can of Campbell's cream of mushroom yeah. soup into this casserole, or add you know take a Ritz cracker pile and crumble it up and sprinkle it on your broccoli with Velveeta cheese and yes. have like a baked ca broccoli casserole. And so, so slowly they, and then there was the TV dinners, and slowly they've been sort of hijacked the American kitchen and, and created a deliberate strategy to outsource cooking to corporations. Yeah. And and we have willingly gone along with that. You know, McDonald's tagline was "You deserve a break today," right? Yeah. And and so what's happened is we've raised now a few generations of people who don't know how to cook, and I can tell you that that I can cook three meals in 30 minutes total mm -hmm. total and have yeah. delicious whole food now yeah. i'm not making fancy recipes 
but I'm making a quick shake in the morning. Maybe I have a salad and we're throwing a bunch of stuff. Maybe pre-washed arugula. Yes. And cherry tomatoes. I have to cut them. I mean, I just I've learned the hacks to make it simple. Yes. And dinner is just usually a lot of stir fried veggies, and I, maybe I throw a baked potato. I mean, a baked sweet potato in the oven, or, yeah. and a piece of uh, grass fed steak or chicken or something, fish, and that's it. It's super simple. But yeah. this family, uh, there, there's you know something in America called food deserts. Mm. Uh, often they should be called food swamps, which is they're more like swamps, uh, and it's one of the worst food deserts in America. Um, and this family of five lived in a trailer. Uh, they were all very obese, um, very sick. Uh, the father was 42, already on dialysis from kidney failure. The mother was well over, I don't know, 200 pounds and change. No, maybe more. I don't know. She was like maybe almost close to 300. Uh, the son was 16 and, and very overweight, 50% body fat. Normal was 10 to 20 and, um, and was this close to being diabetic. Um, and they didn't know how to cook and they were desperate to lose weight because the father uh, could not get a new kidney unless he lost 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they, everything in their trailer, everything in the kitchen was box, package, canned, low fat this, healthy that, you know, peanut butter, but it was peanut butter with high fructose corn syrup and yeah. trans fats. And uh, they really wanted to do the right thing, but they didn't know how to cook. So I said, well, let's just like cook a meal together. So we got a guide on how to eat well for less. And we got um, from the environmental working group where I'm on the board. And we, we got ingredients like real lettuce, not iceberg lettuce. We got, you know, salad components and olive oil and vinegar, actual dressing instead yeah. of. And we got turkey chili. We made, you know, turkey chili. And we made, um, we made some roasted sweet potatoes chopped up with herbs and spice in the oven. And I don't know what else we made, uh, some stir fried asparagus. They didn't know how to stir fry a vegetable. They didn't know how to make a salad. I mean, they didn't mm. know anything. And I showed them how to cook one meal. And they were like, this is fun. And we did it together. And it didn't take that long. And then they were like, this is great. I said, you can do this. And I left. And I'm like, here's my cookbook. Here's a guide on how to eat well for less. They didn't even have cutting boards or knives. So I literally went home and went on Amazon. And I ordered cutting boards and oh. knives. And I had them shipped to their house. And uh, the mother texted me when the first week they lost 18 pounds together as a family. Uh, they started cooking. They lost 200 pounds together. The son tried, lost 50 and gained it all back because he went to work at the only place to get jobs down there, which were fast food restaurants. And he says, like, putting an alcoholic in a bar to work. Yeah. Finally, he got out of that and he lost 138 pounds. Uh, and now he's going to medical school. And... All that took was teaching them to show them what was in their cupboards. Like I literally showed them, look, Cool Whip says zero trans fat, but all it is is trans fat and sugar. And the reason it says zero trans fat is because the government is in cahoots with the industry and has allowed them to say it has zero trans fats if there's less than half a gram per serving. And yeah. since Cool Whip's mostly air, uh -huh. it's like basically sugar and trans fat. Yeah. And I'm like, they showed them all this and they were like, Yeah. And they had no idea. And so we got rid of all why, that. Why would they? Yeah. You know, so, the, yeah. So it's possible. Yeah. I think the myth that cooking is expensive, that it takes more time, that it's difficult. Uh, it's just a, as a myth. It's like any other skill. Like, would you drive a car without learning some basic skills? No. You need to know how to chop. I mean, they didn't know how to cut an onion. They didn't know how to uh, peel garlic. They didn't know how to mix the salad dressing. I mean, these are... Just building blocks of cooking that are so simple. You need to know yes. how to roast and bake yeah. and stir fry, and I mean it's not that hard. Uh, you know, you can watch videos on YouTube and <laughs> teach you how to do it. Yeah, although I, certainly in the UK, people are watching a lot more cookery programs, but cooking yeah. a lot less. So it's well, not they're watching more cooking on television. They are cooking, but it's not cooking programs because you, if you, if you watch those programs, it's fancy things, it's complicated, yes. yeah. it's it's like a sport. Just basic skills, yeah. like. They're not teaching you basic skills on those shows. Yes, yeah. It's funny what you said about the food industry hijacking the recipes because it actually reminded me that it wasn't so long ago I was actually promoting Sweet and Low in the UK. <gasps> oh my <laughs> Sorry, God. Mark. Oh, and you... one of the things they gave us was these recipes that was just like, it was like a, a can of Campbell's soup. I mean, they were, 
that were just like, so like no one's going to want to make these. But it was all food industry stuff that they yeah. kind of dressed up as home cooking. Right. So, yeah. But I've, I've switched jobs since then, yeah. as, as you know. Yeah. Tell us a little bit on, on fats. So I know that you have dived very deeply into the subject. Um, and you've written a fabulous book, Eat Fat, Get Thin, which I've read twice. Um, so when I do my group workshops at companies all over the UK, the biggest bombshell for people is when I talk about low fats and um, refined vegetable oils. There really, I find, is zero awareness that refined vegetable oils might not be a brilliant thing to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and I must tell you, actually, I, I used to indirectly work for the low fat food industry back in the 1990s because my job was to, um, I handled PR for US conglomerates, I handled their Euro European PR, um, and they made chemically modified food starches that went into low fat food products that mimic the creaminess and the yeah, mouthfeel right. that you get. Right. And I, I loved it at the time, and I, I found it just brilliant science, and I was very excited about it. But looking back, I think, what an insanity that they, they made these chemicals in a, in a laboratory to replace something which actually didn't need to be replaced mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us about vegetable oils. Why are these not a great idea to eat? Well, I mean, if you look at the history of our species, we consumed a diet that had whole food fats yes. with a few exceptions, uh, like olive oil. Mm -hmm. Right, so olive oil, but olive oil is a pretty simple process. You just yes, squeeze the olives, the olives. Yeah. and that's it, right? Um, An extra virgin is, you know, less refined, obviously. So there was a process of ref oil refining, which was able to extract seed and nut and bean oils. I mean, there's no vegetable oil, right? There's no broccoli oil, even though they say vegetable, but it's seed and bean and nut oils that um, we... We consume beans, we consume nuts, mm -hmm. we consume seeds. That's fine. But when you extract them, it's done in such a way that, uh, first, it's a very chemical intensive process. There's yes. hexane. They use solvents, And don't solvents yeah. and deodorizers and all sorts of smelly. chemicals. Yeah. And so they, 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 they use that oil. And it now has become 10% of our calories is soybean oil, which we never consumed 150 years ago and now it's the majority of the oils we eat and it's 10 percent of our overall calories and there's a couple of problems one is um you know we always had a combination of omega-3s and omega-6 oils um this woman by the way that i was telling you about with the diabetes and mm -hmm. the heart failure she ate all this processed food she had almost 20 times as much omega-6 as omega-3 her omega-3 was almost non-existent and she had very high levels of omega-6 from all the processed food. So it's not like you're necessarily even eating the oil. You don't even know you're eating the oil because yeah. it's in every processed yeah. food. Yeah. Right? Which is, and um, it's, it's um, something that we never did before. So we had ratios of omega-3 and 6 of 1 to 1, maybe 1 to 3, 1 to 4. Now it's like 20 to 1, 15 to 1, 10 to 1. And, and this imbalance in this omega-3, omega-6 has, has created all sorts of issues. Um, omega, these refined oils are also unstable. So they're, they're called polyunsaturated oils. So they're very unstable. And you've tasted rancid oil. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. People know that. But these, these are also can be a little bit rancid, even though they don't taste rancid. And then yeah. when you consume them, they're easily oxidized in your blood. So they're easily turned rancid in your blood. And they are also, most of the LDL that is um, the problem in the blood is the one, or the, is the LDL that's got a lot of these omega-6s, not the saturated fat LDL. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think there have been some experiments um, and, the, you know, where there, there are large trials of epidemiology where people who eat more of these plant oils do better. And... The question is why is it a cause and effect because these studies can't really show cause and effect and it could be that the people who were told to eat more omega-6 oils as a healthy thing back in the 80s and 90s and when these studies were done they were also more health conscious in general mm -hmm. as opposed to the people who were eating 
meat and saturated fat and all this who were not health conscious. So they were more like a smoker, not exercise, or not eat fruits and vegetables. So it's, it's hard to prove that it's cause and effect. Now, there's a few studies that have been done that are experimental trials, and you know, those have found that they may not be so helpful. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I would love to see bigger trials on that to get more evidence, but I still think, from my point of view, based on the current evidence and also based on the this kind of common sense view of why would we consume a thousand times more of some refined new industrial product and how could that be okay with our biology, right? Yeah. I mean, I just, I'd rather yeah. be safe than sorry. So have omega-6, have these ref oils, but have them in their whole food state. Yes. Eat the beans, eat the nuts, eat the seeds. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. So last week I was giving a workshop mainly to men in their 40s, 50s, 60s. They were all eating huge amounts of junk. And quite a few of them have said, look, um, I've been told I've got high cholesterol. So um, I am, um, they hadn't changed any of the junk, but they had made a couple of changes. They were avoiding eggs and they were eating rapeseed oil, canola oil, mm -hmm. I think you call it here. Um, and that was, so the junk had stayed, all the sugar, huge amounts of sugar. And so I wondered what you felt about that kind of approach to, as they saw it, preventing heart disease. Bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, eat real food. I mean, just think about how many steps it takes to get from the field to your fork. Mm -hmm. And if it's more than a couple of steps... I mean, the amount of steps to make these refined oils is a lot of steps. Yeah, I've seen the video. <laughs> the amount of steps to, you know, make butter or Yeah, you make, could shake cream and it would turn into butter. Yeah, or make, uh, and that's what they did, the butter churn. Yeah. I have a butter churn in my house. It's from the 1800s. It's an antique oh. butter machine. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to have olive oil, yeah, that's something you could yeah. probably make in your backyard if you yeah, wanted. Yeah. But, like, the rest of it, yeah. not so sure. And eggs, that used to be rationed, but yeah, that that advice has been revoked. Well, I find there's a new study that kind of said, well, maybe they're okay. Um, there was another study. As a, every week, there's a different study that yeah, comes out. Yeah, so because because the, most of the nutrition studies just look at correlation. They tell ask people what they eat. Yeah, they look at their outcomes and see whether there's some link. But the link may be an artifact. It may not be a true cause and effect. In fact, 80% of studies that show a link in the population studies actually are reversed in a randomized control trial. Okay. So, so, so you're still you're still so, eating eggs. So I'm still eating eggs. Uh, that, you know, there was a big study that came out that said eggs increase your risk of heart disease I by seven, that. 17%. Yeah. And, uh, you know and death and all that and when you look at the study it's like okay well they took thousands of people they followed them for years they asked them what they ate once in one questionnaire and these food frequency questionnaires are pretty unreliable and those have been really shown to not be that valid mm -hmm. uh, I mean think about it you know so what did you eat last Thursday for dinner what did you have for lunch last Wednesday you probably don't remember uh, yeah. and so they try to and people also aren't honest like if they if they're not going to say they had three pints of ice cream, but they'll say they eat more vegetables, right? So yeah. they might have to, you know, so the people aren't completely on it. Uh, and and they, they found that there was this increased risk. And, you know, correlation studies can be helpful. Like smoking, there was a 20 to 1 increase in the risk of lung cancer. That's a big risk. If there isn't a 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, you probably it's probably meaningless, right? Yeah. So in this study, it wasn't two or three, it was 0.17 or yeah. 0.18. But That's pretty meaningless. And then yeah. every, and then there's the next week, there's a study that shows, yeah. oh, people who eat, don't eat a, uh, eggs have a higher risk of stroke. So eggs are protective against stroke. Yeah. Like, so it, it makes the average consumer confused when you don't understand the studies. It's so bewildering. Yeah. It, it really is. And that's why, um, you know, I love my job because I help people navigate their way through all this conflicting information. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so often they do have the information. You know, I, I have a shelf of books in my where I coach with books by all my favorite doctors. All and of mine, I hope. Of course, of course. <laughs> and so often, you know, people will come in and they'll say, oh, right, I've got that one, that one, that one. Great. And then I, I get them to do like a 
three day you know lifestyle fill in a form and I have a look at what they're eating and wow I mean it is not to say it's not following the books it's the polar opposites yeah. and there's just no correlation um so that's why i think that it's not just the information well maybe they never read them maybe they never read them <laughs> maybe i do think there's something in that that i think sometimes people go on amazon and pay 15 pounds for a book and that is kind of in their head they okay. are investing in their health even though they, they right, perhaps right, don't right. do anything with it but the point is, um, from my experience, it takes personal support in addition to the information to help people actually implement it. Of Would you agree sure. with that? For sure. I think getting a health coach, getting someone to do it with, being in a group, yeah. uh, faith-based wellness programs, whatever, whatever you can do to get a buddy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I did a health program in a church. Uh, with a pastor in America, and he says, everybody needs, needs a, a buddy. buddy. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's really good. And I always say, getting healthy is a team sport. And so yeah. we all need that, you know. We all do. And the truth is, we know from the data that you're more likely to be overweight if your friend's overweight than if yes. your family's overweight, that yeah. your environment plays a huge role, that your zip code is more important than your genetic code. Yeah. So I think we really need to, to remind ourselves that, you know, if you want to make a change, you need to be accountable, you need to have support, mm -hmm. and that that really is what works. Okay, so so how do you feel health coaching will evolve over the next few years? Well, if I were king, um, or prime minister, or president, I would literally hire a million health coaches to help solve our chronic disease epidemic and get them deployed across every healthcare system in every community. Well, let's pray that. That that comes to be. Because no, I don't I, want to be I, president. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be prime minister. Ah, uh, no. It's the last job no, I want. That really is. But but, mm -hmm. I really appreciate everything that you do, and just um, I'm so very grateful for you making the time today yeah. amongst your busy, busy, busy schedule. Thank so you. thank you so much, and uh, thank you guys for watching.